This is Rosa Scheib with another episode of Satoshi's Treasure Hunters. And this is a special episode, um, the long talked about but not quite produced uh, episode in which I review the Sprawl Trilogy, the William Gibson Trilogy, which contains The Necromancer, Count Zero, and Mona Lisa Overdrive. And why am I discussing this particular set of trilo trilogies, if you will, or this trilogy? Uh, these books is because uh, Eric Meltzer, one of the game makers, has spoken often about William Gibson and cyberpunk as being an influence on the game. And that might allow or kind of give a hint to the kind of game dynamics that might be occurring in the game. Particularly the fact that it's a very um, text adventure, very ARG. You have... Um, this narrative thread that has been woven into the game with some of the clues in which have some kind of uh, influence in the cyberpunk world. Just the very nature of the game itself is very cyberpunk. Even more cypherpunk, really, if you think of the fact that the prize is uh, in Bitcoin. And so the reason why it has taken so long for me to do this trilogy, I have started this... Um, video more than once has nothing to do with William Gibson as a writer. I enjoy him as a writer or this particular trilogy in general. It very much has to do with me. Uh, <laughs> upon reading the book, um, I read The Necromancer like a long time ago, like in high school or something to that extent. It might have been even in middle school. Uh, I was very into sci-fi and fantasy at the time. And Reading these books, reading the stories, um, it was a little difficult because I hadn't read Count Zero or Mona Lisa before. Uh, so re rereading Necromancer and uh, reading Mona Lisa and Count Zero, I realized how much of an influence William Gibson has had on sci-fi, on that whole film noir genre um, and seeing some of the tropes and seeing some of the influence it, it made me very difficult to basically read the primordial soup upon which a lot of this is based off of because I've basically seen it all before for example if you look at uh, the new game coming up, Cyberpunk 2077, is very steep in that very early cyberpunk world. In fact, as much of the genesis of cyberpunk, its aesthetics and its dynamics, very much come from the same period of time as William Gibson. I mean, cyberpunk, uh, I think it was 2020, was a role-playing game, uh, one of those role-playing games like D&D, &D, um, back in the early 80s and has survived and lasted very, very long time. You have, um, you know, the Netflix series, um, Altered Carbon. Uh, a lot of these aesthetics, like the, the, the atmosphere that a lot of cyberpunk operates in, um, I've seen it in all these different films. I've seen it in, you know, Cowboy Bebop, uh, Asylum, Dread, uh, the, the philosophies and the different... Uh, social uh, commentary that many of these films are um, are doing. I've seen it before. I've seen that in the you know corporations are kind of taking over or bad. You have authoritarian uh, regimes. You have people bas basically living on the edge and kind of squalor or uh, scrambling around and having to be criminals in order to to survive. Um, a moral ambiguity of the many of the different characters. Uh, you see this in The Matrix, where you see the emergence of um, cybernetics in human existence and the questioning of a person's soul. Uh, you very much see that in uh, Ghost in the Shell, where you have uh, the main character, Miko, very much representative of that world. And the fact that um, that, that particular story takes place in Japan, uh, which is a number of the uh, stories that come from Owen Gibson take place in Asia and there's a lot of reasons for that it has to do with um, the time he was writing Japan was very much on the rise as far as technology goes as far as a lot of the new inventions were coming from you know Japan 
then you have things like uh, Stranger Days, which I think had the best uh, iteration of really the, the core story of uh, like Johnny Mnemonic, where you have the character of, you know, Molly as a bodyguard uh, protecting, uh, I forgot what Ralph Fiennes' character was in that, in that uh, movie. Uh, even the aesthetics of it, of the dystopia of it all, of the corporations, of the greed and the control, and the device that he uses to jack into a system, uh, I think is a great representation from from what William Gibson basically started. And most importantly, uh, I think uh, Angela Bass's character is probably the best iteration of the character of Molly, of that bodyguard, badass assassin with some bit of more amb ambiguity here for the paycheck, but still not only protecting the person she's supposed to be protecting, but having a bit of a, a moral code to her uh, in that film. And then you have, you know, again, Ghost in the Shell, you have Akira, uh, you have all these different films that discuss the philosophy of the soul and the... Uh, workings of the human existence and what technology does to a society, what technology does to an individual. Um, a lot of that um, takes place in these different stories, particularly the Matrix, if you will, where you have, instead of a corporation, you have basically uh, robots control everything. And everything is a very falsehood. Um, that's something that's a recurring theme in, in the sprawl about um, advertisements and how there is a falsehood in in the world that everyone is operating in, and it's everything is just this crap illusion, and there's no realness. The only realness is maybe jacking into the system. So when I began to read these stories, I just couldn't help but think of all the other stories and movies and books or even games that I have uh, played or witnessed and seen before as reading these novels. And it's not fair to these novels or to the trilogy overall. Uh, it just, you know, again, yeah. it's me. It's me because I have seen all this stuff previous and so it kind of clouded and it was hard for me to see sprawl uh, in these individual books uh, on their own merits versus to what I've seen the influence of. It's kind of like I would say watching maybe Flash Gordon um, which had an influence on Star Wars and seeing kind of the corniness of it and not really kind of getting the quite the full appeal of it uh, by watching like the original serials and even to some extent when they did the movie it incorporated a lot of that corniness. I, I personally, you know, I'm a child of the 80s, so I do kind of like Flash Gordon. I realize it's a bit trash, but there's a lot of trash movies that people like. And so seeing the, I guess you can say, the foundation, it was a very, very hard for me to not picture the house, if you will, um, by looking at the foundation as William Gibson's Sprawl trilogy has built out for this particular genre. But I do think it has some appeal for anyone who's interested in the Sochi Treasure Hunt game. Uh, I think they're, by kind of understanding that the, the dynamics of the books and what it's talking about, you can kind of see some of the um, a little odes and clues that are going on in the game, particularly the very personalized nature of a lot of the clues. Like, for example, uh, the Aesop fable, you know, something that people were read to as a child and continue to be read to. But connecting that to world war, not not world war, but new world, new world order, um, a music group, and that code, if you will, uh, some of these clues have a personal touch or hint to where you can see is connecting to someone's personal life, if you will, of why they would incorporate that bit of piece of um, history or a piece of knowledge into the into the hunt, into the game. Um, I also think that potentially um, some of what has been written in the sprawl or any of the William Gibson's books might be um, hints for uh, solving puzzles later down in the uh, hunt. After all, we've had 32 named keys, uh, 32 puzzles. We have um, 50 keys released in total uh, because some of these named uh, puzzles, if you will, um, are multiples. So. I imagine that there will be some kind of play into that. For example, the most one of the more recent clues, um, Final Destination. That's an 
late aught early 2000s slasher teen movie if you will uh, is a um, it's proven to be a bit of a difficult challenge for people to solve but then again because um, none of the public groups have stated that they solved it and we don't know from the indication of the website anymore if a clue has been found so far no one's been able to solve that particular puzzle and so there's that hint and then there's also the fact that the key is named united which gives up the united airlines and then we've had some issues with planes crashing like any other airlines but they have quite a few famous ones and so it's a bit morbid if you will and the movie itself final destination deals with a plane crash so that's a bit morbid in itself so <laughs> those type of weird you know connections and clues uh in the game um are interesting and so reading this i i thought that it and I think it does give, you know, some insight to at least one of the game maker's thought processes and thinking. And so I, I encourage any hunter or any members of any clan or clan as a whole, maybe the new book club or something, to either reread these books or read these books themselves. Um, they also have audio, so it might make it easier for people to, you know, when they're commuting or at home or doing whatever, to put on the audio and have these books read to them and be able to absorb the knowledge from um, the books. I, again, I really enjoyed the trilogy. I really enjoyed the different books. I think Mona Lisa is probably my favorite of the books. I know it's not doesn't get much praise as every um, Necromancer does by people. And I think really because Necromancer was the first and it was very um, groundbreaking at the time it was released. And it's still, and it's still a very classic novel. But I, I personally like the story that goes on in Mona Lisa. But as far as a review, review goes, I, I don't think I can properly review the book without tainting my viewpoint about the different books themselves and the stories that are integrated and what is being fully spoken about and beyond his generalization just simply because I've seen so much of the influence in all these different you know, movies and uh, games and things that I have... Um, participated in or consumed, um, it's kind of, you know, clouding and gobbling my eyes. But again, I still recommend the book. You can pick it up on anywhere from Amazon. Um, you can even find the audio on YouTube and uh, things of that nature if you're on a budget or something like that and listen to the audio books. So that's it. Uh, my name is Hiroshi Scheib. This has been Sasoshi's Treasure Hunters um, discussing um, the Sprawl Trilogy and um,